ikal Quran ni tashko. Illa tazkirat alimai yaksha. Ladies and gentlemen, next we would like to invite Assistant Professor Dr. Hendrik Bin Lamsali, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Students Affairs and Alumni, to deliver the welcoming speech. Please welcome. Thank you, Mr. MC. Our honorable guest, Dr. Zaki Abdul Karim Naik, Associate Professor, Dr. Hijatullah Abdul Jabbar, Member of University Management Committee, Mr. Zamri Binuth, the Chief Operating Officer of One Center Malaysia, Associate Professor, Dr. Ismail, Director of our Islamic Center, Dr. Masudi Mahmudin, Director of Student Affairs Department, Senior University Officer, Perkim Club Advisor Ustaz Zari Zakaria, Moderator Program Dr. Aminur Rashid bin Yatiban, Muhammad Izzat Siraj, Student Representative Council of UUM, Program Director Muhammad Imran bin Osman Maidin, Beloved Students, Ladies and gentlemen, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, first of all, allow me to express my gratitude to Allah Subhanahu wa taala for His infinite blessing, blessing that have enabled us to gather here in a very, very meaningful event. It is indeed a pleasure and honor for me to be here. And I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to all those involved in ensuring the success of this program. Before I go any further, I would like to remark that I sincerely believe that this program is a very significant event, given that greater understanding concerning religious interests in our life can be explored in depth, especially among the younger generation nowadays. As we can see, and for Dr. Zakir information, this hall is our biggest hall in UUM, but it's not big, it's not big enough for you. <laughs> and for the first time, Dr., I don't feel any air condition in this hall. Because, because there are so many people who wanted to come here tonight, and listening and meet you here. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the main objective of this program is to nurture open-minded students and to cultivate first-class mindset while promoting racial tolerance and unity among Malaysia. 
I consider that the organization of this program is an initial step in raising awareness, especially among educators, parents, students, on the importance of respecting the sensitivities of other races. As Malaysian, we should respect our diversity by accepting as a valuable heritage that may not exist in other countries. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Hujatul Islam Imam Al-Ghazali asserted that be together like these two hands, do not become divided like these two ears. When the right hand moves forward, the left hand moves back. When left hand moves forward, the right hand moves back. Ultimately, we feel comfortable walking and strolling on the road. But if both hands move forward or both hands move backward at the same time, what will happen? The illustration explained the importance of preserving brotherhood and fostering unity among us because of our differences in terms of belief and ideology may cause intolerance, extremism and dispute that might undermine the values of unity and brotherhood among us. Ladies and gentlemen, and for our important guests of tonight, Dr. Zakir, UUM students is a future professional, is a future managers, leaders of the country. So that's why we are fully On behalf of the Vice Chancellor of UUM and our management team, we are fully supporting your speech tonight. And our, my belief is that the topic is really relevant to UUM students. Before I conclude, I would like to urge everyone to make an effort to attain better understanding and tolerance, in addition to find a focal point that will further enhance and strengthen our unity to prevent any situation that would cause conflict, prejudice, and hostility. I urge all that attend tonight, take as much knowledge as possible from Dr. Zakir to take it as your knowledge for your future. On that note, let us be united without being forced to favor any belief and with that, thank you very much. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, and now for the highlight of the event, the grand speech by Dr. Zakir Nai. Please welcome Dr. Zakinai as the speaker and Dr. Aminul Rashid as the moderator to proceed with this event. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good evening. Uh, thank you, Brother Hazim, for handing over this session to me. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, our honorable guest today, Dr. Zakir Naik, Yang Berbahagia Professor Madia Dr. Henrik bin Lamsali. Deputy Vice Chancellor of Students Affairs and Alumni, Dr. Masudi Mahmudin, the Director of UUM Student Affairs Department, Associate Professor Dr. Hijatullah Abdul Jabbar, as a member of UUM Management Committee, Encik Muhammad Ashari bin Yaakob, Director UUM Student Development, Division Department of Student Affairs, Encik Zamri Winoth, Chief Operating Officer, One Center Malaysia, uh, Professor Madia, Dr. Ismail bin Haji Ishaq, the Director of UUM Islamic Center, Tuan Haji Ahmad Puat Abdul Hamid from Perkim Changlun, 
Ustaz Zarai Zakaria, the Perkim Club Advisor, Muhammad Izzat Siraj bin Muhammad Yaz Zainal from UUM Student Representative Council, Muhammad Imran bin Osman Maidin, a Program Director, a distinguished guest of brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Indeed, we are very grateful, we are very, we are very grateful, we are very thankful. Thank you to Allah for inspiring us together to come here and be together in this very meaningful event. May Allah continuously shower us with His blessings, inshallah. I'm Amin Rashid Yatiban, will be with you as a moderator for this wonderful session with our distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, who will deliver a special talk with an exciting title, Duty of a Muslim as a Professional. I believe that most of us know Dr. Zakir Naik with his awesome lectures, inspiring words and amazing oratory skills. Uh, by the way, uh, there are even many more international recognition and great achievements of him that should be shared from his very impressive profile. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor by professional training and renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai, India. Dr. Zakir Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with a reason, logic, and scientific fact. In the last 20 years, he has amazingly delivered over 2,000 talks around the globe to clarify Islamic viewpoint and clear misconception about Islam. With range of significant contributions to da'wah fill and creative efforts in disseminating beautiful message of Islam, Dr. Zakir Naik had respectably received plenty of international awards such as King Faisal International Prize 2015 for service in Islam, the prestigious Dubai International Holy Quran Awards, Islamic Personality of 2013, and Toko Mal Hijra, Distinguished International Personality Award for the year 2013 from our late Yang Dipertuan Agung Almarhum Tunku Abdul Halim Muazzam Shah. Undoubtedly, he really deserves to always be ranked within the top 70 list of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world issued annually by Georgetown University, United States of America since 2011. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in over 200 countries of the world. Over a hundred of his talks, dialogues, debates, and symposia are available online and on DVDs. He has also authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the ideologue and driving force behind Peace TV Network. He launched Peace TV in English in January 2006, it being the largest watch Islamic as well as any religious satellite TV channel presently in the world with over 100 million viewership, of which 25% are non-Muslims. In its footstep, he launched Peace TV Urdu in 2009, Peace TV Bangla in 2011, and Peace TV Chinese in 2015. Inshallah, he plans to expand the Peace TV network to cover the 10 major languages of the world. Very, very impressive, isn't it? Therefore, uh, without further ado, uh, brothers and sisters, now it's the time. Are you ready, sisters? Yeah. Are you ready, brothers? How about our brothers and sisters out there? And maybe outside as well? Are you all ready? Yeah. 
And now, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, UUM, we proudly present you Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nai to the stage. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma bad. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Kuntum khaira ummatin akhrijat linnas. Ta'muruna bil ma'roofi wa tanahuna in munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yasilli amri. Wa halul uqdatan min lisani yafkaw kawli. My respected professors, my respected teachers, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be, in, for me to be invited in the University of Tara, Malaysia. I have been to most of the states of Malaysia, I think nine or more than that, but it's my first speech in Kedah, in the UUM. And inshallah, as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Hendrick said, first, but not the last. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is duty of a Muslim as a professional or duty of a Muslim professional. Before we dwell into the topic, let us understand what is the meaning of the word professional. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word professional means a person who is skilled in a particular subject or a particular activity or the word professional means according to Oxford Dictionary engaged in a specific activity which is his main paid occupation so professional means a person who is skilled or competent in a particular activity. For a person to be a professional, he should be trained in that activity. For example, if a person wants to be a medical doctor, he should be trained and he should pass his graduation in the field of medicine. If a person wants to be an engineer, he has to pass his graduation in the subject of engineering. If he has to be a professional lawyer, he should be trained and a graduate in the field of law. If he has to be an architect, he should be trained and should pass the graduation in the field of architecture. In short, if you have to be a professional, you have to be trained in that subject of professionalism. And for a person to be a successful profession, he should follow 
the rules and regulation of that profession. For a person to be a successful medical doctor, he should follow the rules and regulation of medicine. For a person to be a professional engineer, he should follow the rules and regulation of engineering. For a person to be a professional lawyer, he should follow the rules and regulation of law. In short, the more you follow the rules and regulation of that professional, the more you will be a professional in that field. The more experience you are in that field, the more will you be a professional, more successful profession in that field. This was, in brief, in a nutshell, the meaning of the word professional. But today's topic is not duty of a professional, but today's topic is duty of a Muslim as a professional. What is the meaning of the Arabic word Muslim? Muslim means a person who submits his will to his creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God. In short, a Muslim is a person who follows all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim is a person who follows the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What is the definition of a Muslim professional? A Muslim professional is a person who submits his will to his creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follows all the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of the last and final messenger and follows the rules and regulations of his profession. Please let me remind you that just because the name of that individual is Muhammad, Zakir, Sultan, Abdullah, and he's a professional, that doesn't make him a Muslim professional. That doesn't make him a Muslim professional. For a person to be a Muslim professional, he has to follow the rules of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and follow the rules of his profession. If he has a Muslim name, Muhammad, Zakir, Abdullah, Sultan, and doesn't follow the rules and regulation of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is not a Muslim professional, rather he is a namesake Muslim professional or a pseudo Muslim professional. So please keep in mind in this complete talk of mine, whenever I use the word Muslim professional, it means a person who submits his will to Allah, follow the, follows the rules and regulation of the glorious Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and follows the rules of his profession. There is a golden rule for a Muslim professional. That what if the teachings of Islam, the teachings of glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him contradicts with the teachings of your profession. In such case, the golden rule is that you have to follow the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith and not the teachings of that profession. Whenever the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the teachings of the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, if it contradicts with the teachings of your profession, the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our, our creator, and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the last and final messenger, overrules the teachings of that profession. This is the general ruling that if the head overrules the assistant head. If your CEO overrules your assistant CEO, the word of the CEO has to be followed. So here, our ultimate boss is our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you a few examples for a better understanding. For a professional salesman, a salesman is taught that a good salesman is a person who is able to easily sell his goods to his customer. And there is a very famous saying. A good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo. 
How many people have heard this idiom before that a good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Please raise your hand. How many, how many have heard this before? How many? Very few. I think this was a university of management. It's a very famous idiom. Who has heard it before? Please raise your hand. Hardly anyone. Yes, there are few people, but compared to, I am told there are about six, seven thousand people in the auto area, many people sitting on the floor, and a few thousand outside. Anyway, this is a very famous idiom, a saying that a good salesman is a person who sells a refrigerator to an Eskimo. I would like to ask you a simple question. Can a Muslim professional sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Can a Muslim be so competent enough to sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Yes or no? Yes, who says yes, raise your hand. Can a Muslim be competent enough to sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Who says yes, raise your hand. Who says no, raise your hand. Both the times I think there's a language barrier. <laughs> yes, people are laughing. It means they're understanding me. But when I'm saying yes, no one is raising that. When I'm saying no, no one is raising that. Again, let me ask that question. Who says that a Muslim professional can sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Raise your hand. MashaAllah, now more than. Who says a Muslim professional cannot sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? Raise the hand. Okay, everyone hasn't participated, but more people agree that a Muslim can sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. According to me, a Muslim professional cannot sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Why is the question, why? Because selling a refrigerator to an Eskimo means you're selling a good to a customer who does not require it. So in the field of salesmanship, he's a professional salesman. He's selling a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Where does Eskimo require a refrigerator? But it shows his skill, professional person. But according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Sunnan Abu Dawud, volume number four, Hadith number 3452. The beloved Prophet said, anyone who cheats is not one of us. If you're selling a refrigerator or Eskimo, you're selling a good which is not required by the customer, that means you are misguiding him, you are cheating him. So this is not permitted according to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. So now the teachings of Quran and Sunnah contradict with the teachings of professionalism. So what do you do? You follow the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. It overrules the teachings of salesmanship. Irrespective how much bonus you get, that is besides the point. Irrespective you may get a raise in the salary. They may raise your position. Okay, now you have become head of sales. But if it contradicts with the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, you do not have to follow the teachings of salesmanship. Is it clear? Let me give you a few more examples. <clears throat> In the subject of hotel management, normally when you do your bachelor's in hotel management, they teach you that when you're serving your customer beer, you don't just pour it into the glass. That's not the style. The professionalism says, that when you're serving beer to your customer, you tilt the glass at an angle of 45 degrees. And you pour the beer on the sides of the glass. So it slowly goes into it. Once the glass becomes about 50% full, half full, you make the glass straight and pour it in the center. I won't describe the logic of it. 
because you know there's more froth and bet all that leave it aside but can a professional muslim professional hotel manager serve beer in this fashion yes or no no why it contradicts the teachings of islam Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 90 Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu O you believe Innamal khamru wal maifuru Most certainly intoxicants and gambling Wa anzaab wal aslamu Dedication of stone, dedication of arrows Rishthu minam in shaitan These are said in handiwork Fashtanimullah lukum tuflihun Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper Allah says that drinking alcohol, intoxicants, gambling, dedication of stone, idol worship, divination of arrows, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number four, Hadith number 3381. Our beloved Prophet said that Allah has cursed 10 categories of people who deal with alcohol. The person who distills it, the person for whom it is distilled, the person who drinks it, the person who transports it, the person for whom it is transported, the person who serves it, the person who makes a profit from the sale, the person who buys it, the person for whom it is bought. All these 10 categories of people Allah has cursed. So if you are a professional hotel manager, if you serve alcohol, Allah will curse you. So, irrespective whether you serve direct or tilting the glass at a 45 degree angle, irrespective of whatever it is, you cannot serve alcohol. Let me give you one more example. I'm into business management and I'm told that this is the maximum students that are here, according to the deputy vice chancellor, is in management and social studies. When you're doing your bachelor's in business management, BBM, or MBA, if you are a professional entrepreneur or a businessman, and when you want to start a new business, and if you don't have a capital, the best way to obtain a capital which you don't have is to take a loan from a conventional bank on interest. It is the cheapest and the easiest way. In other ways, you have to maybe share a lot of profit. Bank, only the interest rate. Depending upon the country, maybe 2-3%, maybe 4%. If it's a country where inflation is high, maybe 8%, 10%. As a Muslim, you cannot take loan from a conventional bank on interest. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Bakhra, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279. Oh, you believe, give up your demands on riba, on usury, on interest. And if you give up not your demands on interest, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you do not, if you indulge in riba, in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. According to Imam al Dhabi, it is the twelfth major sin in Islam. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who takes riba or gives riba or is a witness during the riba transaction, all three, they will not go to Jannah. It is worse than drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol is the 19th major sin in Islam. It is haram, major sin, but Allah and the full will not wage a war against you. If you take interest, Allah says in the Quran, Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you. And unfortunately, majority of the businessmen in the world, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unfortunately, they take interest from a conventional bank. It is haram. As far as Islamic banking is concerned, there are some reservations, but if you have option to take from a conventional bank or Islamic bank, take from Islamic bank. I would prefer not taking from any bank. It is the best.
to be safe. But if you have to take, take from an Islamic bank, it may not be 100% Sharia compliant, you cannot be, but to a great extent, yes. And Malaysia, the country that we are living in, it is the second largest in the world after Saudi Arabia as far as Islamic banking is concerned. Even the conventional bank have an Islamic window. Let's not go into the interest-free banking. That's another lecture of mine. But I hope you got the message. If it contradicts with the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, follow the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. Let me give you another example. In professionalism, we are taught that when you meet a customer or your colleague, especially the first time, normally you shake hands to break the ice. When you shake hands, it's an informal way of greeting. There is closeness developed. There is a rapport between the two people. That is professionalism. As far as Islam is concerned, if a Muslim professional shakes hand with any other Muslim, with any other professional or any other man, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, no problem. If a female Muslim professional shakes hand with any other female, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, no problem. But in Islam, a Muslim professional man cannot shake hand with a female irrespective of whether she is a Muslim or non-Muslim if she is a Nahmeram. And a female Muslim professional cannot shake hand with a male, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if he is not a mehram. The close relatives who you can marry, husband, brother, sister, mother, and son, all these are permitted. But if it's a foreign, means a nahmeram, it is not permitted. But normally when we move around in the world, especially in the Western world, and now it has percolated to most of the countries in the world, it's common that when professionals of opposite sex meet, they usually shake hands. And normally, if an opposite sex extends the hand, especially if a lady extends the hand to a Muslim professional, invariably, by reaction, your hand will go and you'll shake it. Unless you're mentally prepared, mentally you're trained that I do not have to shake hands with the opposite sex. Unless you're mentally trained, it's an invariable reaction that your hand goes off forward. I remember when I was invited by the president of Gambia in the 2014 as the main guest of honor, chief guest, during the national day, and I happened to be on the stage. He was in the center, his wife on the left, I was on the right. And the function was going on suddenly, you know, most of the dignitaries, they were ambassadors. Then suddenly I find that people coming onto the stage and shaking. And then since I was on the right of the president, the first person that shook hands was with me. And I had no problem shaking hands. Suddenly I see the ambassador of USA coming. She happened to be a lady. And I see her walking up the stage. And now I'm in a dilemma. I'm the guest of the president of the country. You know, I don't want to offend him. So now, should I, should I take care of my host, the president of the country, or should I follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The answer is very clear cut. Let him be the president of any country, or prime minister, or the king. If it contradicts with your creator, you overrule. And when the ambassador of USA lady, when she extended the arm, I said, may peace be on you. And I said, my religion does not permit me to shake hands with a lady. I was prepared for the consequences. But Alhamdulillah, the president of Gambia, when he noticed me, immediately signaled the foreign minister to come on the stage. And he whispered something, and the foreign minister was next to me. The moment the next lady came, he told, please don't shake hands with Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. I was impressed with the president of Gambia. 
I thought that, you know, maybe he'd get angry, but no one gave no rule, man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was, mashallah, he protected my, my status, awkward position, and the foreign minister did the job for me, and the function continued. You are sometimes in many awkward positions that though you know it is wrong, but you give in to it because, ah, the prime minister is there, oh, the king is there, oh, the president is there, how can I... How can I go against the Prime Minister or the... And by Allah's grace, I had many occasions. I'll just give you one sample. So when shaking hands is there with the same sex, no problem, it's correct. It gets closeness to you. It creates a rapport. I agree with it. But you can't create a rapport with the opposite sex. It's not permitted. For more details, you can refer to my lecture on women is right. I'll not go into the details. Let me give you one last example. You know, there is, there is a profession called as personal secretary. It's a profession. And you have got courses on being a personal secretary. And very often, in most parts of the world, not always, but mostly, for a gent boss, you have a lady personal secretary. As far as the teachings of Islam is concerned, a lady being a personal secretary to a gent boss, or a gent being a personal secretary to a lady boss, it is prohibited. If you take utmost care, it can reach makroor in a few cases. And there are various reasons for this. You know, personal secretary is taking care of the boss's need. And especially in the Western countries, the personal needs of the boss extends. I don't want to go into the detail. Very often, the lady personal secretary takes care of all personal needs of the boss, including haram needs. It's very common. It is not permitted because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of at tirmidhi Sunnah Hadith number 1171, that if two Nahmeram are secluded in a room, the third person is the Satan. If two Nahmeram are secluded in a room, the third person is a Satan. If you are a personal secretary, there will be many occasions where your gent boss would be giving you instruction in his cabin when the door is closed. It is not permitted. The third person is a Satan. It is haram. Whether they do any act or not, the act of being alone with a naham haram in a closed room itself is prohibited. As for shaking hand, the hadith is of Jami al Kabir, Jami al Mutam al Kabir, hadith number 486, that it is preferable to stab in the head an eye and needle than to touch the part of an unlawful woman. Therefore, touching is haram. Other hadith of Tirmidhi says that if you touch, a man touch a part of a non-mehram woman, that part will burn in hell. So based on the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, touching a non-mehram opposite sex is prohibited and being a personal secretary. Other post, maybe it can be accepted as long as you follow the rules of Quran and Sunnah. But being a personal secretary, of a nahmeram, female secretary of a man or a man secretary of a female boss, in most of the cases, harab may go to makro. So I hope by these examples, it is clear what is the basic golden rule of the duty of a Muslim professional. Now we go ahead with the topic in detail. In professionalism, we are taught 
that when we do a job or when we sign a contract, when we get employed, we have to follow all the rules and regulation of the contract. It's taught in professionalism. But if you're a Muslim professional, there is a double duty that you have to follow what you have signed in the contract. Because besides the rules of professionalism saying that you have to follow your contract, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, that fulfill the contracts that you have made. Allah says in Surah Maharaj, chapter number 70, verse number 32 and 35, that those people who fulfill their covenants and their trust, they will enter Jannah, a garden of bliss. Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 8 and 11, that those who fulfill the covenant and the contracts, they will enter Jannah and they will dwell therein forever. That means if you are a Muslim professional, you have to follow all the rules and regulation of what you have signed in the contract. But you have to be careful. Any rule and regulation should not go against Quran and Sunnah. But if it doesn't go, it becomes a double duty to follow it. Let me give you an example. If the contract of your job says that you have to be in the office from 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., that means you have to see to it that you have to come to the office before 9 a.m. and leave the office after 6 p.m. It's very common that many a times you receive a phone call from your family member, maybe your wife, your husband. You know, you may receive a call from your friends and you speak for maybe 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes for an hour. When you're speaking during office hours with your family member or friends, what are you doing? For that 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, you are not doing the duty of the office that has been entrusted on you, point number one. Point number two, besides not doing the duty, you are being paid for the time you are speaking with a family member or your friends. This is not permitted in Islam. There are many times, and it's very common nowadays that during office hours, the employee goes to social media, WhatsApp, maybe YouTube, maybe Facebook, it may be Tumblr, it may be Snapshot, Twitter, maybe Pinterest. You spend every day half an hour, one hour, two hours, come in, chatting. And many times when you go to offices, you find the receptionist or the manager is busy chatting. Spending time on your personal fun, frolic, or personal work during office hours is prohibited. If there is an emergency where you have to speak to your family because there's an emergency, you see to it that you compensate those minutes, that hours, after office hours. As a Muslim professional, you cannot utilize the office time for which you are being paid salary to do your personal work. It's prohibited. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, We have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. Allah says in the Quran that I have created the jinn and the men not but only to worship me. So one of the main duties, one of the purpose of our creation in this world is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word, Ibadah, used here, comes from the root word Abd, which means slave, which means worship. Most of the Muslims think that worship only means, you know, Salah, Zakat, Psalm, fasting, going for Hajj. Yes, these are one of the highest forms of worship. But Ibadah means following any commandment of Allah you're following, it's called as Ibadah. Anything you abstain from, which Allah has told you not to do, you are doing ibadah. So in the work, if you are following the contract, you are doing ibadah. If you are breaking the contract, you are going against ibadah.
There is a very famous hadith called as Hadith Jibreel. It's in Sahih Bukhari, verse number one. Hadith number 50. Once the Prophet was sitting with the Sahaba, then a man, an angel, Jibreel Islam, comes and asks the Prophet three questions. What is Iman? What is faith? What is Islam? Submission to Allah. And what is Ahsan? The hadith is big. I'll jump, jump to the main part that relates to the topic. The third question, what is Ahsan? And the Prophet replies, Ahsan means proficiency. The Arabic word Ahsan means excellence. The Prophet says, Ahsan, proficiency, excellence mean you worship Allah as though you see him. And if you cannot see him, worship Allah as though he is watching you. So according to a prophet, excellence, proficiency, ahsan means at least worship Allah as though he is watching you. Now for an employee, it is common that when the boss is present, you work better. Because you want to show to the boss or your superior, oh, you are very, you know, you are proficient, you are a good employee. So when the boss is there, close to you, watching you, you work a bit extra, you work with proficiency, you do hard work. For a Muslim professional, our ultimate boss is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irrespective whether your worldly boss, your manager, is watching you or not, your ultimate boss is always watching you. So always at work, you will be at your best. If you are a Muslim professional, you have to follow Ahsan. You work as though your ultimate boss Allah is watching you. So you will do your best activity. You will not speak with a family member at office time. You will not go to social media. You will see to your productive, to your company as a Muslim professional. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ismail Sunnan Ibn Majah, volume number four, hadith number 3170, that Allah has prescribed ahsan, proficiency, excellence for all his creations. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed that all his creations, all the human beings, including the Muslims, he has prescribed for them ahsan, proficiency, excellence. That means you have to do things which are excellent. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, It's mentioned in the hadith of Jame Matridi Al Autas, volume number one, hadith number 897. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah loves those people who strive for ihsan, for excellence, for perfectness. Allah loves those people who are perfect, who are excellent. That means, if you are a Muslim doctor, you have to be an excellent doctor. If you are a Muslim engineer, you have to be an excellent engineer. If you are a Muslim architect, you have to be an excellent architect. If you are a Muslim CEO, you have to be an excellent CEO. If you are a Muslim manager, you have to be an excellent manager. We have signed a contract that you have to be in office from 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But you know that if you spend a few hours more, maybe one or two hours a day, or maybe work during holiday, your level in excellence will improve. So what do you do? As a professional Muslim manager or professional Muslim CEO, you spend a couple of hours more, most of the days. You may come to work during holiday so that you achieve the level of excellence in what you have promised. An excellent professional 
with a lesser position and lesser salary is a better Muslim and more beloved to Allah than an incompetent professional with a better position and better salary. It's difficult to digest everything. Let me give you a simple example. An excellent assistant manager is more beloved to Allah than a, with a lesser position and lesser salary than compared to an incompetent manager with a better position and better salary. Have you understood this golden rule? Yes or no? That means many of us strive, okay, increase my post, increase my position. When your post increases, when your salary increases, if you're incompetent for that post, Allah does not love you. It's better to be on a lesser post and be competent with lesser salary and lesser position than strive for a higher post and be incompetent for that post. Is it clear? These are all golden rules, all gems from the Quran and the authentic sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 60, Hal jaza'ul ahsan illa al Is there is there any reward for good? Is there any reward for good other than good? Is there any ahsan? Is there any reward for ahsan better than ahsan? Is there any reward for excellence better than excellence? Allah is telling you in this verse of the Quran that the best is you have to excel in your profession. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it mentioned Sayyid Muslim, verse number six, hadith number six, 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 three, seven. And our beloved Prophet also said, in Sayyid Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 6774, that a strong believer is more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. That means a strong professional is more beloved to Allah than a weak professional. It means a competent professional is more beloved to Allah than an incompetent professional. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 76. There is a parable of two people. One of them is dumb. And he cannot do any good. He is a very same burden for his boss. Whatever he instructs him, he cannot do good. On the other hand, is he better than a person who is truthful on just and on the straight path? Yeah, Allah in the Quran is giving an example of two people. One, some, one person is a dumb person who is a burden for his boss. Cannot do any good. Is he better than a person who is on justice and on the straight path? And the answer is clear. That means Allah prefers you being an efficient, competent professional than an inefficient person, a professional who is a burden for the boss. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu, Wallahu ahubbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195. Allah says in Surah, uh, Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 134. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 134. 148. In Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 13, as well as in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 93, Wallahu yubbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. Allah loves those who are proficient. Allah loves those who are excellent. So if you want Allah to love you, you have to be efficient and proficient 
in your profession. And the best example is our beloved Prophet Muhammad. A Muslim professional should be trustworthy. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, he was given the title Al Amin, the trustworthy. So much so that even his enemies, they trusted him more than the others. They were his enemies, but they said, okay, if we have to leave any of our goods when we are going out of town, the safest person, the most trustworthy person in the whole of Mecca was Muhammad. Even the enemies left their goods with the Prophet. He was given the title Al Amin. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it mentions in Sunan Abu Daud, oil number four. Hadith number 3534, a beloved prophet said that entrust your trust on the person who has given you trust. That means someone has entrusted you with something, you fulfill your trust and do not betray the person who betrays you. Double instruction. Fulfill the trust on the person who has given you the trust and do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. That means a Muslim professional should be trustworthy. And do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. And we know when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Hijrah, when he did Hijrat from Makkah to Medina, he told Hazrat Ali Radhiallahu that these are the goods the people have kept me for safety. When I go away, give it to so and so person, all these goods who were belong to. Imagine these people were the enemies of the Prophet because of whom he leaves Makkah. They are after his life, some of them. They want to kill him. Yet, what the Prophet says, this is an amana. They entrusted that good with me. When I do hijrat, give these goods to so and so people. This is called alabin. And second, do not betray even the person who has betrayed you. So as a Muslim professional, you have to be trustworthy. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, mentioned Sahih Muslim, point number six, hadith number 6637, that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which leads to Jannah. Lies leads to wickedness, and wickedness leads to hellfire. That means a professional Muslim should always be truthful and honest and should not lie. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Point number three, hadith number 2079, the beloved Prophet said that a seller and a buyer, they can either keep the goods or return as long as they do not depart. As long as they do not depart, the seller and the buyer, they can either keep the goods or return the goods. And the hadith continues that both of them should speak the truth. They should tell the good things as well as the defects of the goods. Then there will be baraka in the transaction. If any of you lie and even hide the defects, there will be no baraka in the transaction. Normally, in professionalism, you are taught that you have to always praise your goods and hide your defects so that you can sell the goods. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, when you are a buyer or a seller, speak the truth. Tell the good points, also the defects. If you hide the defects, the transaction will not have barakah. So Muslim professional will never lie. He'll always be truthful. He will always be honest. He would even tell the defects of the goods. Now let me tell you one thing, that professionalism actually is of various kinds. Some are short-term professionalism. Short-term means immediate profit. In this short-term professionalism, they teach you no problem, as long as you sell your goods, sell the refrigerator to an Eskimo, hide the defects, but a truly long-term professional, they will always teach you that if you hide the defects tomorrow, they will not trust you for a new product. So in the higher level of professionalism, you will find that many teachings of Quran and Sunnah match with it.
But today's world is a world of commercialization. Shortcut, fatafat. You want to earn money, fast money, tomorrow who has seen. So when you go to the lower level of professionalism, it contradicts with many rules of Quran and Sunnah. But the higher level of professionalism, not all the rules, but it does match with many rules of the Quran and Sunnah. The Muslim profession should be honest and he should not lie. A Muslim professional, he should be strong. And there are hadith, we speak about this. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 265, that anyone who even has an atom of arrogance will not enter Jannah. Arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down on others. Arrogance in Islam is not only haram, it is the 17th major sin in Islam. Even if you are an atom of arrogance in your heart, you shall not enter Jannah. And normally we see that a person or a professional who has more fame, a better position, more wealth, he tends to be more arrogant. But a Muslim professional, the more power he has, the more fame he gets, the more wealth he gets, he has to become more humble. It is compulsory that a Muslim professional should be humble. He cannot afford to be arrogant. And the more excellent he is in his profession, the humbler he has to be. And the best example was a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A beloved Prophet at his time was the main, most famous human being on the earth. The most powerful on the earth. People were willing to give him the wealth of the countries. But our beloved Prophet was one of the, he was the humblest person that has walked on the face of the earth. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 135, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you believe, stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, whether it be rich or poor. Here Allah is talking about justice. And you should not favor anyone. It's talking about that you have to be on the haq, as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if that truthfulness is going against your own self against your parents, against your relatives, against the rich or the poor. We can understand from this verse very well that as far as being honest, truthful, you should not take any sides, even if it's against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives. The first time when I read this verse, I could not understand what does the Quran mean by against the rich or against the poor? Against the rich, yes. Maybe he'll benefit you tomorrow, so you can give a verdict in his favor. But why should someone give a verdict in favor of the poor? Later on I realized what Allah says, that even if it be against the rich or the poor, Allah protects both. That means you cannot say, poor man, if I give a correct justice, he will lose his job. So I give judgment in his favor. That is also not allowed. Poor person, if I punish him for his mistake, how will he sustain? So I give the verdict in his favor. It is not permitted. Allah says, irrespective whether it's rich or poor, you have to be just, adal. And the Prophet said, if anyone robs, even if it be my daughter Fatima, I will cut her hand. Justice. We find many a times in the profession 
of lawyer, especially if it's a criminal lawyer. The more famous he is, the higher is his fees. And most of the criminals, they hire the famous criminal lawyer. The lawyer knows very well that my client is a criminal, he has broken his law, but they use their intelligence to protect the client so that they get a fat fees. A Muslim criminal lawyer, if he knows that his client has broken the law of the country or has done a crime, no way can he protect him in the court of law. Muslim lawyer means a lawyer who follows the Quran in Sunnah, not a lawyer whose name is Muhammad Zakir Sultan Abdullah. I know many Muslim criminal lawyers who are top, and most of them, their clients are criminals. You have a Muslim professional has to be just and there cannot be partialism. There is a hadith of Muhammad where he said that the highest in the scale it is character. The heaviest in the scale is character. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab chapter number 33, verse number 21, Verily, in the messenger of Allah, you will find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. Allah says in Surah Kalam chapter number 68, verse number 4, Thou art standing on the exalted platform of character. Allah, our creator, is praising a prophet that he is on the highest level of character. Every Muslim professional should have a very good character. If he doesn't have a good character, he is not a Muslim professional. He can be a pseudo-Muslim professional, he can be a fake Muslim professional, but if his character is bad, he cannot be a good Muslim professional. As far as professionalism is concerned, it is very important that while you are following the rules and regulation of professionalism, you should not neglect any obligatory duties of a Muslim. There are many obligatory duties. Among the important ones are praying five times Salah every day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving zakat if you have to, going to Hajj if you have to. If you are a Muslim professional, you have to offer five times Salah. Especially those salah which are overlapping with, with your office hours, you have to perform. You cannot say during office hours, you know, I will go home and do kaza. Not permitted. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's a hadith of Sai Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 246, the difference between iman and kufr, it is abundance of salah. If you don't offer salah, it is kufr. You're not a Muslim. And many a times, many Muslims, when they work in non-Muslim companies, especially in non-Muslim countries, many of them, they feel shy to offer salah. You know, maybe they're embarrassed, or maybe they feel that their boss, non-Muslim boss, will not allow them to offer salah. As far as my experience goes, I've traveled in several countries of the world, According to me, most of the non-Muslim bosses, even in non-Muslim countries, they will not prevent a Muslim from offering salah during office hours as long as they do not disturb the other employees and as long as they do their work properly. They will not prevent. Almost all will not prevent. Maybe if they have objection, you can say fine, if I have spent 20 minutes in offering salah, I will work 20 minutes more. Okay, I will work 40 minutes more, no problem. If the salah comes in your lunch time, there's no problem, but if it comes in the office hours, you can work that time extra. Most of the non-Muslim bosses and most of the non-Muslim country will not prevent you, but there are few, very minority, who may object 
If you are not able to convince your boss that you have to offer salah, what do you have to do? You have to leave the job. If the non-Muslim boss forces you that you cannot offer salah during office hours, you have to leave the job. As simple as that. We'll come to the second part of the lecture, how it will benefit. You have to. Maybe Allah will give you a better job. There are various other examples. Keeping a beard, according to all the four madahib, all the four imams. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Nambal, all four imams said that keeping a beard is fard. Some scholars may say it's not for sunnah. So, if you want to keep a beard and your boss disagrees, try and convince your boss. How will it cause a harm? You see my performance, if it's low, you can sack me. But yet if he says no, you cannot keep a beard, what do you do? You search for a better job. Similarly for the, for the woman, for the Muslimah, who are professional, they have to maintain the hijab. If your Muslim or non-Muslim boss, there are some Muslim bosses also don't like women doing hijab or men keeping a beard. If they object and they don't allow you to wear your hijab, you leave the job and search for a better job. Better at least for the akhirah, if not for the dunya. These are golden rules of Muslim professionalism. We'll go to the second part of the lecture. That is tawakkul. Let me ask you a simple question. What is the most common reason that most of the human beings take up a profession, take up a job? What is the most common reason that most of the human beings in the world take up a job? For? For earning money. Your answer is correct. Simple question, simple answer. The most common reason, almost all of the people, not 100%, most of them, for earning money, for sustenance, for risk. All of us think, how much money will we earn for our sustenance? We think about the tomorrow. We have a riskophobia. You won't find this word in the Oxford Dictionary. We have a riskophobia. We have a mania towards risk. We are desperate. We have a despair that what will happen tomorrow? What will we earn? Will we have enough money for tomorrow? When I die, will it be sufficient for my children? All these questions come in our mind. Riskophobia. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 7, hadith number 6748. Our beloved Prophet said that 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote the risk. He wrote the destiny, wrote the qadr, including risk of all his creations. That means all the living creatures in the world, including the human being, Allah has written the qadr, the destiny, including the risk. Not 50,000 years before you were born, 50,000 years before the creation of the heaven and the earth. What is written in the risk, you will get it. No one can add even one penny or one cent or one ringgit to it, no one can take away one penny, one ringgit from it. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 7, hadith number 6723, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the creation in the womb of the mother and get them together in 40 days. Then, that creation is in the form of alaka for the same period, another 40 days. Then in the form of mudga, a chewed like lump. Alaka means a leech like substance, a congealed clot of blood. Then mudga, a chewed like lump, for the same period, 40 days. That means 40 plus 40 plus 40, 120 days. 
approximately four months. Then Allah sent an angel to write down four things. Number one, it is sustenance, risk. Number two, your lifespan. Number three, the good deeds. Number four, happiness or misery. So all these four things, the angel writes, when you are four months in the womb of your mother, your risk, your sustenance has been written. How long will you, will, will you live has been written. The good deeds you will do has been written. Happiness and misery has been written. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it's mentioned in Sunan Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 2144, that our beloved Prophet said, O oh my people, fear Allah and seek a moderate living. O oh my people, fear Allah and seek a moderate living. And before any soul dies, he will get all what is written for a sustenance, even if it's delayed. Means no soul shall die until he receives all what is mentioned in the sustenance, even though it is delayed. O oh my people, fear Allah and have a moderate sustenance. Do things which are permitted and abstain from things which are prohibited. Do things which are halal and abstain from things which are haram. This beautiful hadith tells us very clearly that what is mentioned in a qadr, in the sustenance, you will surely get it. If the whole world wants to prevent you from getting that risk, what is mentioned in a qadr, they cannot. If the whole world tries to take away what is mentioned in a qadr, they cannot. So Muslim professional has tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim professional is not dependent upon his profession for the money he earns. A normal professional, yes, he is dependent on his profession for his risk. He thinks that if he excels, he will get better salary, he will get more income. A Muslim professional who believes in Allah and his Rasul in the teachings of Quran and Sayyid Hadith is not dependent on his profession. What is mentioned in his qadr, he will surely get it. And the Prophet said, reduce your sustenance. So good Muslim, he reduces his requirement. Now once you have less requirement, you don't have to strive and do wrong things to earn money. Most of us human beings, what they do, they live their lifestyle according to what they earn. If they earn more, then they have a big house, they have a very expensive watch, they have a very good car, Mercedes, Ferrari, Lamborghini. So they lead their life according to what they earn. Our beloved Prophet said, make your sustenance less. And by Allah's grace, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me, Alhamdulillah. And there was never any problem of finance in my life. If we wanted, in Bombay where I was, the amount of money we earned, I could own a Rolls Royce, Alhamdulillah. But I was satisfied with the Toyota car. Because the beloved Prophet said, make your sustenance less. And the expenditure of my house in Bombay was about 2,400 ringgit a month. And now you are aware that there are problems. The enemies of Islam are after my property, no problem. Today I require 2,000, less than 2,000 ringgit a month for me and my wife to survive, only. When we had the capacity where we could own a rose voice, we didn't own. Now I'm not fish out of water, I'm very happy. And earning 2,000 ringgit a month is peanuts. But if I was used to the lifestyle of how much I earned before, today I would have been in misery. 
Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith, of Sunan at tirmidhi point number four, Hadith number 2344, that a person who relies on Allah, as he should rely, like the birds, when they go in the morning with empty stomach, they come back with a full stomach. Allah will provide them the sustenance. That means if you have tawakullah, tawakkul on Allah, the reliance as you should have, Allah will provide you. Like the birds, when they go out in the morning with empty stomach, they come back with a full stomach. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in Sai Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 6774, that you should not say, if so and so would have happened, then so and so thing would have been done. You know, many times we say, oh, if I had done this, you know, I would have got a better prophet. If I had done this, this would have happened. Our beloved prophet said, don't say, if I had done so and so, then so and so would have happened, because that so and so will be the shaitan. But you say, Alhamdulillah, this is by the grace of Allah. So Muslim, when he gets a prophet, he praises Allah. When he goes in loss, he praises Allah. Because this is the qadr of Allah. This is the qadr of Allah. And I know, some of you may be aware, that most of the countries are after me, because I'm uh, Alhamdulillah Madai. And you know, you may have heard of many allegations of terrorism, of money laundering, so much so that they want to attach all my properties. And I told my wife that Alhamdulillah, even if the non-Muslim government who's against Islam takes the property of a Dai, that is Alhamdulillah. The property tomorrow, if there's an earthquake, it can be into ashes. They can be a robbery, they can be a loss in the business. What better thing is it that in the way of Allah, our property is taken away? Can there be any better reward? So believe me, not even me and my wife, not even thought for a second, or even did not bat an eyelid. We were very happy. It is hazam in fazli rabbi. It is from the grace of the Almighty God. What is in you, you'll get it. I told my wife, what can be better than a property going in the way of Allah? Imagine the reward we'll get in the Akhara. Alhamdulillah. And we are leading a better life in Malaysia than what we used to live in Bombay. It is Allah who provides. It is the duty that a Muslim professional, he does not rely on his job for his earning. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who provides. And it is he who, alhamdulillah, gives. A beloved prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He has said, and we should not lie. And I'll give you an example that very often when a salesman is trying to sell a good and he may tell that this good, the cost, the selling price, it is 100 ringgit. And you may try and bargain, why don't you give me 50 ringgit? That salesman tells you, madam, sir, I'm hardly making a profit of five ringgit. And after negotiating, he gives you 490 ringgit. It is very obvious, the salesman was lying. If he was making a profit of five ringgit, he gives you a discount of 10 ringgit, it's not possible. Why will he lose five ringgit? For a customer, you are no relative office. Imagine people lie to sell their good. A Muslim professional will never lie. Normally, whenever I buy goods from a hawker, I normally do not bargain. 
If the hawker says, this good is costing 10 ringgit, I know very well it is for 5 ringgit. I buy it for 10 ringgit. And the reason is, I believe that even though I know the object is for 5 ringgit, and I think he's a hawker, a poor man, I'm, he's saying 10 ringgit, I don't question, I give it. Why? I think it is charity with honor. Without saying it is charity, he's a poor man. He's working hard. Okay, give it to him. The actual cost is 4 ringgit. He should sell it for 5 ringgit. Instead of 20% profit, he's getting a profit of how much? Calculate fast. 150%. See, when you're talking, you should be able to calculate fast. If 4 ringgit, normal 20%, 5 ringgit, he's getting 10 ringgit, 6 ringgit, 4 ringgit, 6 ringgit, 150% profit. But sometimes some hawkers say, Sir, it is such a cheap thing, you will get nowhere else. Why don't you buy 5? Now he's lying. He's lying. I know it is not cheap. He told me 10 ringgit. I didn't question him. I wanted to give charity with honor. Now he's lying. Why don't you buy 5? It is very cheap. You will not get anywhere. He thinks I'm a fool. Now, a Muslim professional cannot lie. Okay, you're asking for more money. I didn't question you. You didn't lie. You got the Prophet. Allah gave it to you. Now, 